You can't earn anything in bonds these days, so don't even waste your time. Don't even think about it. Well, if you've been told that, guess what? Think again. And stay tuned to this week's episode of the Retirement Income Source, where it is all about the income. And welcome to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm David Scranton, here with my good friend and co-host, Sarah Samuels. And today, we're going to defy gravity by talking about bonds. I know a lot of you have been told, hey, you know, you can't earn anything in bonds. Don't waste your time. But all of that has changed over the last year and a half. In fact, giving investors the best bond yields they've seen, certainly in over a decade and a half, maybe as close to two decades. So, Sarah, I think this show will be a big uh, eye-opener for a lot of folks. That's right, Dave. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there in bonds, and people need to know about it. Yep. And, of course, thank you to everyone out there listening, and thanks for joining us on the Retirement Income Source. But mm -hmm. bonds, Dave, you know, they're, they're not the uh, the sexiest option out there. There was a lot of uh, slander or, or talking bad about bonds in the past. But uh, like you've said, it's it's a great opportunity last year and a half or so. Yeah, yeah. Now, I assume, Sarah, you, you I always ask you personal questions. Yeah. I assume you and Justin don't have any bonds, right, because you're – no, 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 just not in the right stage. You know, I'm in that growth stage. And, you know, I think that um, while bonds are great right now, I don't think it really works for, for me or for Justin. But I, mm -hmm. I think for our listeners, for people that are nearing retirement, mm -hmm. it's there's a lot of opportunity out there. Yeah. Now, now, hopefully last week we talked about high dividend common stock strategies. Hopefully I got you thinking about how even at your age, you and Justin should consider some high dividend common stock strategies because they can work for younger folks. But you're right. Yeah. Bonds are typically for folks within 10 or 15 years of retirement or who are retired. And, you know, it, it's the reason that retirees like bonds is because when you own a bond, you essentially have a contract. And that contract says that you're going to get a fixed income payment for the life of the bond. And when that bond matures, you get your principal back as long as the company, the issuer is not defaulted. So all you really have to do is not try to have a crystal ball like you do in the stock market, Sarah, and figure out, geez, is this investment going to go up or is it going to go down? What you have to do is just make sure you're with a credit worthy issuer, whether it's a municipality or whether it's a corporation, and say, yes, this company will not fail. And then if you buy it, hold this maturity, you know exactly what you're going to earn. A fixed interest payment that you can count on and a fixed return of principal at maturity. But you know, Sarah, the problem, of course, is up till now, for since ever since the financial crisis, uh, most bonds have been down in lower interest rate environments. Now, now you know how we've consistently, even through the bowels of the interest rate environment, we have consistently been able to get people 5% income in bonds and bond-like instruments because we know what to look for, right? right but right. your average advisor, your average investor doesn't know. And they went through this whole decade and a half period thinking, you know what, all I can make is two or 3% in bonds. That's not enough. That doesn't even keep up with inflation. I don't want to consider it. But now is different, Sarah, because now interest rates are higher. And a lot of folks are starting to get the memo that, hey, I can get 5 6% in bonds um, even if I don't know what I'm doing. So that's... That's good right. news. It's a great option. And that's why I think it's important, of course, to work with an income specialist, uh, work with the guys at Sound Income Strategies who actually know how to get you that 5% even when things are not going so well. So uh, you can check out soundincomestrategies.com if you want to learn a little bit more about that. But let's get into our Ask Dave question. And uh, this comes from Charles in Mississippi. Uh, and Charles says... Dave, I've heard you talk about bond mutual funds, but how are they different from bonds? So Charlton bonds where you have a, a guaranteed interest payment for the life of the bond and you have a guaranteed return of your principal at maturity, providing there's no default. Well, now that you know what those two guarantees are, if you buy a bond mutual fund, Charles, you can forget about those guarantees. Why? Because they simply don't exist. Bond funds do not have any guarantees. In fact, if you were ever to study to get your license as a financial advisor and you came across the definition of a bond mutual fund, here it would be. A bond mutual fund is defined as the stock of a company that owns bonds. So it even sounds riskier. It sounds a lot less assured. But again, like anything, nothing is all bad or nothing is all good. There are places for bond funds. Where? Well, if you don't have enough money to diversify, see, if you have 250000 or more, that's two fifty or more, 
you're better off, I believe, in individual bonds and bond-like in instruments you can cost-effectively diversify. But if you have less than that, then the good thing about bond funds is they are a way to cost-effectively diversify. Heck, you could put $5,000 in a bond fund and you could own 100 different bonds. So automatically you're diversified across many different companies. To do that in individual bonds and bond-like instruments, you probably need to have 250 or more. All right. Well, Charles, thank you so much for sending in your Ask Dave question. And if any of our listeners out there have a question or a comment you want to make about the show, all you have to do is send us an email at askdave at retirement income source. That's S O U R C E dot com. And thank you for listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels, and I'm here with David Scranton. Mm -hmm. And today we're talking about bonds. We're talking about uh, the recent opportunity, actually, that's, that's been mm -hmm. last year and a half half or so with bonds and how previously you may have heard some things that maybe maybe made you not want to consider bonds, but now might be the ch time to really change your mind. So Dave, I have to ask, what, what do you think really created this, this opportunity that we're seeing now in bonds? Because like you mentioned, you really couldn't get much out of it before, and now you can actually get a lot more return. Three letters, F-E-D. Mm, I the could have guessed it. Yeah, the the, Fed. you could have guessed it. The Fed. <laughs> yeah, the Fed definitely, by raising interest rates and doing what they've done, uh, it's caused bond yields to come up. So now you can actually get a respectable return in the bond market. Um, and, you know, we've always known that bonds lower your volatility in a portfolio, right? That was Harry Markowitz won a Nobel Prize in the 50s, I want to say, in, in economics. Uh, for having a theory about how you integrate some bonds within a stock portfolio and how you actually lower your overall volatility risk. In fact, the minimum volatility risk point is about one-third stock, two-thirds bond. So people are trying to be really conservative. That gives them uh, more stability in, in, in their prices. Now, you say, okay, well, why isn't all bonds more conservative than stocks? Well, bonds do move. They fluctuate in value. And sometimes a stock will zig while a bond zags. So again, the minimum volatility point uh, academia has determined, and it's been held for 80 years now, is about one-third stock and two-third bonds. Which brings me to a good point. So, okay, bonds can give you more yield. At least now they can, right? Yep. Um, I said we were doing it before, but most people didn't know how to do it in a low interest rate environment. Now everybody knows you can get more interest in bonds, and bonds can lower your volatility risk also. But it's important to understand that the value of that bond does change as you hold it. So when you buy a bond, yeah, if you hold it to maturity, you know what those two guarantees are. But meanwhile, the bond goes up and down in value. And there are lots of things that cause it to go up and down in value. So you're going to see it on a statement, on an investment statement, whether you're with Schwab or Fidelity or TD Ameritrade, and you see it fluctuate from month to month. But at least you have the confidence to know that it's only on paper. Now, Sarah, I know a lot of stock market-based advisors, growth-based advisors that love to say, Oh, it's a paper loss. It's a paper loss. Well, no, I got news for them. When it's in the stock market, it's not a paper loss. Mm -mm. It's an actual loss because there's no face value or date at which that face value is guaranteed to be paid back. So when a stock's down in value, yeah, it's an actual loss. When a bond is down in value, it literally just is a paper loss. And if you hold it to maturity, providing it's no default, you know what you're going to get. Yeah. And coming up, we're going to talk more about bonds, some of the risks associated with bonds, the different types, and most importantly, help you decide whether or not integrating some bonds or more bonds into your portfolio right now is the appropriate thing to do. I'm David Scranton here with Sarah Samuels, and this is the Retirement Income Source where it's all about the income. Welcome back to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels, and I'm here with David Scranton, and today we're talking about bonds and bond-like instruments. All of the different ways that you can invest in bonds and bond-like instruments and how they could potentially benefit you in retirement, uh, plus why, why right now is actually a unique opportunity for you to invest. Uh, plus, we've talked about the difference between bonds and bond mutual funds mm -hmm. and why uh, they are not the same thing, so be wary of that. Big so, difference. Big, big difference. Difference. Um, but Dave, you know, last week we talked about uh, investing for dividends, right? So that's investing in the stock market. Uh, yeah. Now this week we're talking about investing in the bond market. So obviously there's a lot of different ways to invest. Mm -hmm. How do our listeners out there know what's the right thing for them to do? Well, there are several factors. And first of all, when I talk about bonds, generally I'm talking about bonds and bond-like instruments. So 
I take delivery license of putting preferred stocks in with bonds because preferred stocks have a fixed income they call a dividend, right? So it's not an interest, dividend payment. And they have a par value, a face value, just like a bond. So although preferred stocks are stock in name, they're, they're very bond-like. So I take a literary license to put preferred stocks in with bonds. And then also some bond-like stocks I put in there. So sometimes sprinkling a little bit of BDCs, business development companies, which are basically uh, funds that have loans that, that lend money out to medium-sized companies and real estate investment trusts in there. Sprinkling a little bit of that in a bond and bond-like instrument portfolio can get somebody now 6 7% yield. Wow. Okay. Well, it's pretty um, good. <laughs> pretty good yield there. Now, you remember last week, of course, we talked about just regular old common stock. We didn't talk about preferred stock or real estate investment trusts or REITs or anything like that. And we said, for example, you know, the yield in some of our portfolios is four and a half. So it's not six and a half. It's four and a half, right? So one of the components, Sarah, is to determining whether you should have uh, more stocks or more bonds depends upon how much income you need, right? So if you need more income, you're going to want to go more bond and bond-like instrument because you need the income. Right. That's the, you need that money to replace your paycheck, essentially. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And if you're and, and that wasn't always that wasn't the case two years ago. Two years ago, when interest rates were lower, they were closer to the high dividend stocks, right? But now you can get more through the bonds and bond-like instruments. But also, if you're more conservative, you want to be more bond and bond-like instrument, right? Remember, two-thirds bonds, one-third stock is the minimum volatility point according to modern portfolio theory. So uh, if you're willing to take more risk and you don't need as much income, then you can go more common stock, get a little less income, still significant, but a little bit less than bonds and take a little more risk. Now, what some people do, we talked about this before on the show, Sarah, is they'll take their I need income goals and their I want income goals, right? So I need is how much you need to live the same lifestyle you had pre-retirement. And then I want is how much money you'd like in retirement to do all the other stuff, the stuff that's going to fill those nine or 10 hours a week that you spent working. Right. Now, now you need time or you need activities to fill that time. That's right. And that costs money, right? So, right. so sometimes people will say, well, I want to get up my, I want to satisfy my, I need goals with bonds and bond like instruments, because that's a more contractual income. And then the difference between the, I need and the, I want that could be satisfied with high dividend common stocks, because if dividends get cut, well, okay. So maybe I, I take, a couple less trips for a few years, you know? So that's another strategy. So it's got to do with the amount of income, the risk, and, and, and also um, how much of your I need income is getting satisfied through other sources, through contract. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of different uh, bonds out there and different ways to invest and different things to look into. So uh, let's get into our Ask Dave question, which actually deals with this, this question exactly. So we have Angela from Tennessee. Uh, she said, my parents own a bunch of municipal bonds. Do you think that's the right move for me? Angela. All right. Well, right then and there, you're in Tennessee, and I'm pretty sure Tennessee does not have a state income tax. I believe that to be true. So it's, it's, it gives municipal bonds a disadvantage because the benefits of municipal bonds is they're generally considered to be tax-free. So all municipal bonds are tax-free on the federal level. And if you buy municipal bonds from the state in which you live, then they're tax-free federally and also no state income taxes, right? So in your case, it's just federal because you're in Tennessee. So the question becomes how high of a tax bracket you're in, right? So let's say you're in the highest bracket today, and most of us aren't, but if you were, that's 37%. You have to look at a taxable bond of, a, of the same risk profile as the municipal bond that you're looking at. And then you have to figure out, okay, if I take 37% of the interest away to pay the federal government, how much do I have left on the taxable bond? And is that higher or lower than the tax-free municipal interest payment? And in most cases today, because tax rates are lower, the municipal bond turns out yielding you less money. So unless you're in the top bracket, chances are you're better with a taxable bond, paying the IRS a little bit of tax, you have more left over at the end of the day. Now, people of your parents' generation were programmed to do tax-free bonds. So I see that a lot with older folks. That's pretty common. Um, but for you, it's real simple. You just look at the math and which way am I mathematically better off? Because think about it, right? Your goal isn't to shortchange the government and pay them as little as possible, right? Your goal is to earn the most interest after you pay the government, that you keep the most interest after you pay the government. So again, depends upon tax brackets, but in most cases today, taxable bonds can yield more on after-tax basis than municipals. 
All right. Well, Angela, I hope that helps answer your question. And if any of our listeners or even our YouTube viewers have a question that you'd like Dave to answer, or maybe even just a comment about the show, uh, you can send it to us. Just send us an email, askdave at retirement income source, S-O-U-R-C-E dot com. You're listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels, and I'm here with David Scranton, and we're talking about bonds and bond-like instruments, which uh, Dave has taken the literary license of, mm-hmm. of lumping some other uh, some some stock investments you, in you, there. You but get to do that when you're the host of the show. You, you can take you get literary to do what license. You want. We do it every day, right? Right, right. But uh, specifically, those f- preferred stocks and those business development company stocks and the real, real estate investment trusts as well. But Dave, there's a lot of different bonds out there, right? Like Angela just asked mm-hmm. us about about municipal bonds. You talked about why they weren't so great mm-hmm. in Tennessee. I know there's corporate bonds, there's other government bonds. So can you run through all of the bond options and what people should really look into if they're going to be investing? Yeah. So let's let's close the loop on straight up bonds before we get into all those, you know, bond like stocks, yeah. as, as you said. The, you know, government bonds, uh, ironically, the 10 year government bond, now the interest rate on that, the yield on that is over 4%. Uh, the 30-year government bond is also a little bit over 4%. Uh, the two-year government bond now is like 5%, right? It's much higher, but that's because the market's assuming that rates aren't going to stay this high for a while. They're going to come back down again. So government bonds are really have zero default risk, uh, at least in theory. Now, uh, obviously, any government can default, including the United States, but if that were to happen, then you know, all the banks would go under and we'd be in a lot of trouble. So we have to assume the U.S. government isn't going to default during our lifetime and at least hope that's the case, in which case that makes U.S. government bonds the absolute safest. Uh, then you have corporate bonds. And corporate bonds and municipal bonds are riskier. Most people think corporate bonds, Sarah, are riskier than municipals, although I beg to differ with that. And I'll, I'll, I'll share that, my, my thoughts about that in just a minute. Uh, corporate bonds, of course, are issued by corporations. So it's very important that you look at the credit worthiness of the corporation. You know, there, there are rating agencies that rate the stability of a corporation. And, uh, you know, these rating agencies help us. They're not the be all and end all, right? We learned that, we learned that by watching the movie, The Big Short, about the financial crisis, right? But at least it's a good start. So just like you have a FICO score, you have a credit rating. Um, if you're buying a municipal bond, that municipality has a credit rating also. Uh, if you're buying a corporate bond, that corporate bond has a credit rating. So you want to look and see how high that credit rating is and if you are comfortable taking that much default risk or not. Because remember, the bond's going to fluctuate in value due to lots of market factors. But the biggest thing that you have to do is credit valuation. Is this bond, is this issue we're going to stay in business uh, until they pay me back my principal. And that's where these ratings come in, these so-called FICO scores. Yep. So, so Dave, why, why do you think that municipal bonds could potentially be riskier than corporate bonds? Well, the theory is that municipal bonds can, you know, they're government, so they can r- raise capital by increasing taxes. But we're starting to see how municipalities that raise taxes too much now, people are moving out, right? A lot of people moving from California to Florida, from New York to Florida. So you can't just indiscriminately raise taxes. And if you're a municipality, you don't have much to market right? Mm, yeah. You know, you, you can market tax tax cuts, but if you need to raise brackets, you can't market that. So it's not like you can go out and sell new products. Corporations at least have the ability to go out and design new products, to market new products, to sell new products, to increase revenue. Municipalities are limited because, again, they raise revenue too much and people move to another state. But also think about defense, right? Uh, companies can lay off employees and conserve expenses. Municipalities now are down to bare bones. You can't lay off all your teachers. You can't lay off all your policemen. You can't lay off all your firemen. That's right. So you're stuck. So municipalities, their hands are tied. And I think that that's a big issue we might see down the road that nobody's talking about, which makes in some ways municipalities more dangerous than corporations. Yep. And and there are a lot of different things when it comes to bonds that you uh, really need to investigate and make sure you're comfortable with, which uh, Dave Ward's actually going to cover that next. We've talked the broad mm-hmm. categories, right? Corporate, municipal government. But what do you really need to investigate when it comes to investing for bonds? That's right. I'm, I'm Sarah Samuels and I'm here with Dave Scranton and you're listening to the Retirement Income Source where it's all about the income. <laughs> 
Welcome back to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels here with David Scranton, and today's show has been all about bonds, and soon we're going to be talking about Mm bond-like instruments, but bonds are really important because right now there is a very unique opportunity for you to invest. So we talked a little bit about uh, the different types of bonds. We talked a little bit about the difference, really, between bonds and bond mutual funds and why those two things are not the same thing at all. And just a few minutes ago, we talked about the different uh, categories of bonds, corporate bonds, government bonds, municipal bonds. And Dave actually said that he thinks that municipal bonds might be a little bit more Mm. risky than corporate bonds. So Dave, I know you explained a little bit why you think there's some risks. Uh, There's no product to sell municipal bonds versus the corporate bonds. But tell us a little bit more. Well, let's go back to that FICO score analogy, right? So think about your household, Sarah. Um, If your expenses match your income, then anything goes sideways in your life and you can't pay your bills, right? Interest rates go up on some floating rate loan or somebody gets laid off or their hours get cut and all of a sudden anything goes sideways and you're stuck. So the only two ways to give yourself some buffer is to increase your income or to decrease your expenses. The same is true with municipalities and the same is true with corporations. And like I said, the problem is that municipalities are limited in how they can raise their revenue they can only raise taxes and if they raise them too much again people are going to move out it's very easy and heck we got people now moving to puerto rico because puerto rico has a four percent federal income tax now moving to puerto rico is a bit of a pain in the butt but still people are doing it to save the federal tax if you're talking about moving over state lines i mean that's an easy move for a lot of people and it's happening so municipalities are limited on how much they can raise raise revenue, whereas corporations could always design new products, market new products better, sell products, and and raise their top line. And again, how about cutting expenses? Corporations can lay off employees. They can uh, sublet part of their office building. They could do things like that. And and municipalities can't do a lot of that because they're down to bare bones right now. Like I said, they can't lay off firemen and policemen and teachers and all that. And frankly, right now, with a lot of the pensions that are, are that are really underfunded pensions for those teachers and police officers and firemen. A lot of municipalities are in trouble right now and and really have to come up with money to fund those. Yeah, well, it makes sense why that might end up being more risky than the yeah. uh, the corporate bonds. But Dave, what are some of the other features of bonds that our listeners really need to be aware of and, and make sure they understand? Well, most important thing is the maturity. You want to figure out how long uh, of a bond you want to buy, five years, 10 years, 15, 20, and it depends on lots of factors. Uh, then you want to look at, okay, is this callable? In other words, is it redeemable early by the issuer, right? The issuer, if they want to pay off their debt early, they can call the bond and force you to take the principal back. So do you want callable or or non-callable? And and in some cases, some bonds are even for corporations are convertible. So they may pay a lower interest payment, but you can convert them to shares of common stock if the stocks do well. So that's more of a play for somebody who needs less income but wants some upside potential. So again, there's all different things to look into other than just the credit ratings. Yep. All right. Well, let's get into our Ask Dave question. And this question comes from Utah. We have Trevor. And he says, what do you think about TIPS? Uh, and TIPS is all capitalized, Dave. So I presume he's not talking about the uh, tip you might leave when you when you go out to dinner for the waitress. So nope, nope. What, this is kind of like the uh, dogs of the Dow strategy mm-hmm. from last week, right? So tell us what what are TIPS? TIPS. I'm going to pronounce that properly. TIPS. tips. I'm going to enunciate okay. the P. TIPS are Treasury Inflation Protected Bonds, and they've caught a lot of press lately because this past year they paid seven percent, uh, which is wonderful. And part of that's because they're tied to inflation. Of course, inflation was higher, so they paid more. Last two years, they paid more. So that's good in a high inflationary environment. The problem I have with tips, though, first of all, you can only buy, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but I want to say uh, an investor can only buy, I want to say 25000 worth of tips. I'm, I'm, I may be wrong. Um, so, for example, institutionally, we can't even buy them. And if you're an investor and you want to buy 25000 in a year on that, that's okay. It it's complements other things that you have. But the problem I've always had with tips is the uh, it's like the wolf guarding the hen house. You know, the government, as you know, does everything to keep inflation down. I mean, the Federal Reserve right now is hiking rates, and they're not technically the government, but they're, they're hiking rates trying to push inflation down. So the government does things to try to keep inflation low. Moreover... 
we've known for years, anybody who's been retired for years knows that the effects that they feel due to inflation are higher than even what the government does publish, right? Of course, yeah. So, so as a result, you have the wolf guarding the hen house. You have the person that's issuing the bond, i.e. borrowing money from you, that wants to keep the interest rate as low as possible. So imagine now you come to me and say, Dave, will you lend me money? And I say, sure, I'll lend you money, no problem. But I am the one who gets to choose how much interest I pay you each and every year. And you have to take that interest whether you like it or not. The question is, would you ever borrow money on those terms? Yeah, I don't even think the, the mafia, you know, had terms like that. That's, that's right. pretty rough. <laughs> that's right. And essentially, that's what tips are. So yeah. although they've caught a lot of spotlight in the last couple of years, just philosophically, I'm not a big fan. Yep. Yep. Sounds like it's hit the uh, the fox guarding the hen house, Dave, yeah. like you mentioned. But um, thank you, Trevor, for sending in your question. And if anyone out there has a question that you'd like Dave to answer, all you have to do is shoot us an email. That's askdave at retirementincomesource, S-O-U-R-C-E dot mm -hmm. com. And thank you for spending your weekend here with us on the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm Sarah Samuels, and I'm here with Dave Scranton. And today, today's show has been all about bonds. So everything you need to know about bonds, the different types of bonds, uh, Dave just covered Cover all the different features of bonds that you need to be aware of. Uh, but Dave, there's there's a couple different types. We've got investment grade bonds versus non-investment grade bonds. So how can our listeners really know the difference between these two? And that's the first thing you have to think about before you get to what the maturity is and do I want one that's callable or one that's convertible? You have to say, okay, can I, what rating do I want to have? What am I comfortable with? And here's the strange thing. The different rating services, depending upon who they are, might have 15 to 20 different ratings, some more than 20, uh, that they can rate with a bond. And what they do is they draw an artificial line between two of the ratings. And they say that anything above this line is called investment grade, and anything below the line is called non-investment grade. Or you might have heard the term junk bonds before, right? Well, the problem is that line is about one quarter to one third from the top of all the ratings. And it's arbitrary. So imagine this, Sarah, you know, you've got a, you know, a bank that will only give you a loan if you have a credit score of over 700. So you go to the bank and your FICO score is 701. Yay, you get the loan, right? I'm your neighbor. My FICO score is 699. Ooh, I don't get the loan, right? Yeah. But what if you then found out that well, the reason mine's a 699 is I went through a nasty divorce. My ex-wife was supposed to pay the credit cards and she didn't pay the credit cards and it messed up my credit, right? You might go through that type of deeper analysis and find that my 699, I'm a better credit risk than you are. Right, yeah, it might actually be higher if you didn't have these other things happen in your past. That's right, yeah. so a bank that drew that, ordin that, that, that line between 701 and 699 is just being lazy. They're just saying, yeah, we don't wanna look at anybody under 700, it's too much work. So I share that because a lot of financial advisors are the same way, Sarah. They just, they go above the line. They won't go below the line because they don't want to do the work. And in their defense, they may not have the bandwidth to do that type of research uh, within their office. A lot of advisors are one or two advisors, a few staff members, or they may not have the money to go out and invest in uh, terminals that you need to have, which cost 25, 30 grand a whack to, to do this type of research. So in their defense, there might be reasons they don't do it, but at the end of the day, they're not willing, they're just not able to do that research. So again, they just say, if it's investment grade, great, everything else we don't look at. Whereas a good an income specialist, Sarah, will look below the line and really fact find and find out all the quantitative evidence as to why I have a 699 credit score and here's a 701. Because there are hidden opportunities with those 699s. And the beauty about it is that sometimes they'll pay one or 2% more. So you're still moving, you got 20 different ratings, you're still going from rating number six to rating number seven, let's say, but you're able to get significantly more interest because you're below that line. So again, some great opportunities there if you know how to play that, that credit risk properly. Yep. And that's why it's important to work with an income specialist when you're doing this kind of investing, because like Dave said, uh, they have the right equipment, they have the right uh, knowledge and experience to be able to get you the best for your money. So uh, we've talked about bonds a lot, but there are other things out there, these bond like instruments, and they could be right for you. You'd have to determine a few things first, which we're going to talk about. I'm Sarah Samuels here with Dave Scranton, and you're listening to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about mm -hmm. the income. 
And welcome back to the Retirement Income Source, where it's all about the income. I'm David Scranton here with Sarah Samuels. And today we're having this conversation about bonds. But if you're just joining us, stay with us because these aren't your grandparents' bonds that we're talking about. So far, we've discussed how the interest rate, what the Federal Reserve has done with interest rates over the last year and a half, has made bonds an attractive alternative once again, even though we felt they always have been. But they now other people are starting to realize that they become more attractive. We talked about why bond funds may not be the answer for a majority of you. The difference between government bonds, municipal bonds, corporate bonds, as well as some of the ratings, how to focus on the ratings and use the ratings to your advantage if you have the capacity, the knowledge, and the willingness to actually do the work to look beyond the ratings themselves. Yep. So Dave, let's talk about these bond-like instruments. Now, I know you're taking a little bit of license here calling these things mm -hmm. bond-like instruments, but I think you make a good point as to why you're calling them that. So tell us why. So, you know, I t said before preferreds. Preferreds are more bond-like because they have a fixed dividend payment, an interest payment. They happen to call a dividend, right? They actually pay a little bit more uh, on a percentage basis than most bonds. Uh, they also have a par value, a face value like the bond, where if it gets redeemed, it gets redeemed at that par value. So, again, you know what you're going to get. In fact, companies uh, don't like to cut dividends on prefers. They look at it as being as important to pay those dividends as paying the interest on bonds. They look at it as a default if they miss a payment. So why are preferreds more stock-like? Well, simple, because they're a perpetual instrument. Mm. They go on forever, whereas bonds have a fixed maturity date. So I call them bond-like because they're much more bond-like than they're stock-like, and they, in most cases, pay a, a higher yield. Right? So that's the simple one. But now we get into BDCs, business development companies, right? And Sarah, if you think about what bonds are, bonds are loans, right? Corporations make us a loan, a loan, we buy a bond. Municipalities make us a loan when we, or, or, sorry, we make them a loan when we buy a bond. We make the municipality a loan, we buy a municipal bond. We're making loans. So what the BDC does is make loans to medium-sized companies. Why? Because if you're a big company, go to Goldman Sachs, you do initial public offering and you issue bonds. If you're a small company, go to a local bank. If you're a medium company, there's no place to go. You're not big enough to go to Goldman Sachs, and you're not small, and you're too big to go to the bank. So these companies make loans to these medium-sized uh, BDCs, make loans to these medium-sized companies, and by you buying into that BDC, you're buying a stock of the BDC. But the things that are in there are are loans. So it's kind of like a bond fund except that I like the way it's managed a lot better. I like the fact that it fills a void in most people's fixed income portfolio that they just haven't filled. Uh, and, and frankly, the yield on BDCs are usually a lot higher than your typical bond fund. So that's a bond-like stock. And last, the REIT, the Real Estate Investment Trust, right? Yeah. Think about our office here, right? We just, we signed a 10-year lease. We're here for a long time in this building. So to somebody who owns this building, it's kind of like a bond. It's cash flow. If they do the credit analysis on Dave Scranton and on Sound Income Group, right, and they, they say, we like their credit, they're going to stay in business for 10 years, then they take us on as tenants. So when you're evaluating a REIT, you've got to look at the tenants to make sure they're credit worthy, because if they are, you're still going to get that income. So again, although you're buying a stock of a company that owns real estate, uh, in many ways, it's more bond-like because of the income and how the research is done. Yep. All right. Well, a lot of people are looking into these CDs. They're looking at high yield savings accounts. They're looking at the money market. And our next mm -hmm. Ask Dave question is no exception. So we have Patrick from North Carolina. He says, Dave, I saw the other day I could get four, four and a half percent on a short term CD. So should I go ahead and invest in that? Patrick, great question. And, you know, simplicity in lots of areas of life has its benefits. And we just talked about the complexity of, gosh, bonds and bond-like instruments and all this. But here's the reality, Patrick. Uh, we know that banks know how to make money, right? So the only reason they're paying you 45 is because temporarily, right now, they can make 7% on a mortgage. They can make more on a car loan. Okay? So that's why they're doing it, because interest rates are high. The problem is... You cannot find a 10-year CD right now, Patrick, to pay a competitive interest rate. They're all short-term. Why are they short-term? Because they know that the Fed is going to lower interest rates again. This is a short-term blip in history, an opportunity, if you will, when interest rates are higher. So if you want to invest more for the I instead of total return, like I always talk about, 
I first, G second, interest for income first, growth second. I love your thinking. But the question is, do you want to solve the income shortfall short term or long term? Because I would contend that if you're buying the CD, Patrick, you're only solving the problem short term because that CD is going to renew in a year. It's going to renew a year later. And on one of these renewals, it's going to come in at 3% and 2% and back to 1% like they've been. And you're going to be out of luck. And by then, if you want to lock it in long term with bonds and bond like instruments, you're no longer going to be at the rates we have today. You're also going to be a lot lower. So bank CDs, Patrick, are great if you want to buy something, an RV, a new car, something in a year, two years, three years, because they're safe. But if you're trying to invest for the I for retirement, then again, I believe strongly that bank CDs are not the right answer today because the high interest rate ones are only short term. And you got to ask yourself, do you want to solve the problem short term or do you want to solve the problem throughout your retirement? And Patrick, thank you so much for sending in your Ask Dave question. And, you know, it seems like if if you, uh, depending on where you are, Dave, in your retirement, maybe you like the short term, like you said, the lump sum versus versus uh, the long term income solution. So uh, if you would like to send in your question, you have a retirement question for Dave. All you have to do is send us an email at askdave at retirement income source, S-O-U-R-C-E dot com. And we appreciate you joining us here on the retirement income source where it's all about the income. Yeah, we do. I'm Sarah Stanley. And I'm here with Dave Scranton. Today's show is on bonds and bond like instruments, all of the different things that you need to know, uh, the benefits, really the differences between bonds and bond mutual funds, mm -hmm. and really the uh, the benefits of these bond like instruments, as, as Dave calls them, which mm -hmm. is, you know, stock market investing, but a way that you can get uh some uh, income out of that using yeah. using those investments. So, uh, Dave, how do you know if if you should invest in these bond like instruments? Is it is it more than just whatever your risk tolerance is? It's your risk tolerance, and yeah. it's the amount of income you need. Because again, you know, we talked about high dividend stocks last week, and I said with some of those high dividend strategies, don't try this at home because it takes deeper research. Uh, so, if you need more income, you want to be more bond heavy. You can get more income that way. If you uh, have are more conservative, having closer to two thirds in bonds and bond like instruments might make sense. But you know, the, the real issue too has to do with, you know, can you, you know, we said with the stock side, don't try this at home. And I would say too, with a lot of the bonds and bond like instruments, for most people listening, it's something they don't want to try at home. Because again, if a lot of financial advisors don't have the wherewithal, the bandwidth, or the money to invest in the proper terminals to be able to analyze bonds, then I think the average do-it-yourself investor is really at a loss. You know, they think they've got a brokerage account at Vanguard or Schwab or Fidelity, and they can do this. And maybe they get some information from the person on the other end of the phone. Maybe they have a, a computer program they can get online. They can screen the bonds, and they can see all different maturities and what the interest payments are, or is it convertible or non-convertible, how much interest they're giving up with a convertible bond, and, and all you know, different interest rates for the different ratings. They can do that. But again, you can't look through it. You certainly can't look at that FICO score as to one is, why is one notch below the investment grade line and the other one's one notch above, the 699 versus 701. So that's where it gets really difficult for do-it-yourself investors doing it at home. And then to make it worse, and, and Sarah, most of our listeners, I don't think know this, but when you buy a bond, your broker, which could be your broker through a big firm or could be your broker through, again, Schwab or TD Ameritrade or Fidelity or Vanguard or whomever, your broker doesn't have to tell you how much he or she is tacking on to the price of the bond. It's not like a stock where they have to disclose the commission. So you could be buying a bond at par value and, and maybe they bought it at 97%. They tacked 3% on. And that's the problem when you do it yourself. Because again, without the proper terminals, you don't have the transparency you need to know you're getting a good deal. And then you throw in this universe of bond-like instruments and you try to do the research, Sarah. And, right? I mean, it's... I'm already overwhelmed. So yeah. I, yeah, and you try to figure out, yeah. And you try to figure out, okay, you know, which are right for me and which are not. And yeah. it becomes a lot. And that's why I think you have to be careful. And that's where, you know, if you're, if you're not really, really knowledgeable, then having an income specialist to help you in that area, especially uh, is probably good advice. Yep. And if you're looking for an income specialist in your area, all you have to do is go to retirementincomesource.com. It's the name of our show. And you can actually click on our interactive map there and find someone in your area or the surrounding areas that can help you that has a specialized knowledge when it comes to these bonds. Mm -hmm. Because at least for me, Dave, it does not sound like it's a do-it-yourself do, do -it -yourself friendly kind of endeavor here. 
No, I would have to agree with that. I can't argue. It's uh, that's hey, that's what that's that's why we're that's why we have a whole business, right, Sarah? That's right, Dave. And you know these uh, these last couple of shows, you know, we did the Dow, uh, the investing for dividend show. Uh, now we did bonds and bond like instruments. Yeah. So I think uh, next show, I think we got to talk about annuities. You know, the good, the, the good, bad, yeah, and the ugly. The bad and the ugly. All yep, right. When it comes to annuities, so. All right. Well, if you enjoyed this show, if you maybe want to share it with your friends or listen to it again, all you have to do is go to retirementincomesourceradioshow.com and you can listen to all of our episodes there. And most importantly, if you have any question at all about the good, the bad, and the ugly with annuities and why they're so controversial, you're also going to want to be joining us next week, same time, same station. I'm David Scranton here with Sarah Samuels, and this is the Retirement Income Source where it's all about the income.